All right, welcome everyone to this evening's program, 10 Things You Might Not Know About the American Revolution. We are so excited to be joined by Guilford Courthouse National Military Park. That is a mouthful. Interpretation Ranger, Jason Baum. My name is Morgan and I'm a reference librarian here with the Greensboro Public Library. And I'm located here at our downtown central branch. Um, so before we get started, I'm just gonna go over some really brief um, housekeeping and introductions and then we'll turn it over to Jason. Jason. So again, as a reminder, this program is going to be recorded. Um, we're going to do our best to try and keep all your personal information off that. But as part of that, we encourage you to keep your mics off and your videos off. It makes a better experience for everybody else. Um, and it just makes the program run a little bit smoother. Um, now with that in mind, if you have any questions at any time throughout the program, I'm going to be monitoring the chat. So as you think of questions you would like to ask Ranger or Jason, please just type those into the chat and I will be happy to uh, ask Jason those for you at the end of tonight's presentation. We've tried to leave at least 10 minutes for questions um, and Ranger Jason has uh, very kindly agreed to drop us his email address. So if you have any questions that Jason can't get to in the time allotted, you can ask them to him directly. All right, um, so if you experience any problems with technology tonight's technology, of course, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Uh, best thing to do is log off of zoom close it out and log back in. Your link should still be fine, the link um, you used to um, access this program initially, so give that a try. Um, feel free to um, message me in the chat though, and we'll do our best to help you out. Uh, so both the Greensboro Public Library and the Greensboro History Museum have a number of great virtual programs coming up. If you joined us just a little bit ago, you might've heard Glenn and I chatting about all the things we're excited coming up. So I really encourage you to check out our websites and social media and I will link those into the chat so you can see what's coming up next. Now I'm going to briefly turn it on over to Glenn Perkins who's the curator of the uh, curator of community history excuse me Glenn uh, for the Greensboro History Museum to say a few words. Thank you Morgan uh, it's great to be here and I've been invited to be a co-sponsor of this program. Um, if you hear any barking, it's just my dog Rosie in the background, but I think we'll be all right. I just wanted to, um, again, say how excited I am and mention that, you know, for more than a year, the History Museum has been focusing on the story of American democracy and particularly how that story relates to Greensboro. And the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, you know, is such an important point of change in that story of American democracy. And we highlighted that earlier in 2020 alongside a Smithsonian traveling exhibition that was at the museum called American Democracy, A Great Leap of Faith. And one of our most, we were able to bring out one of our most remarkable artifacts in the museum collection, which is a 200 year old knit cap that belonged to Arthur Forbus. And Captain Forbus uh, was in the North Carolina militia and, and was one of the individuals who fought in the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, and he was actually mortally wounded in that battle. Um, we also, as, as part of that story of telling the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, we also partnered with local DAR chapters to highlight the experiences of some of the women during the revolution. And a lot of those stories, you know, uh, get, get sidelined, but we were able to rely on their research that they'd done into pension records, uh, which shed some amazing light on some of the, the sacrifices that women had to make during the revolution, whether they were camp, camp followers or veterans widows. Um, and we continue to tell the story of the revolution and the, especially the battle at Guilford Courthouse uh, through individual voices in our museum, uh, including that of Ned Griffin, who was a, um, an African-American soldier who fought at the battle uh, and then later had to petition for his own freedom from slavery. Um, so there's just so many different interesting perspectives and stories on this battle and on that revolutionary moment in, in here in Guilford County. And so I'm super excited uh, to learn from Jason tonight about some of those things, some of those things I didn't know about uh, the revolution as well. And I hope that you guys will, after you're done, if you're curious, uh, check out our website for more about that. Um, check out, of course, Guilford, uh, the National Mer Military Park website, 
Um, we will be uh, talking a lot more about these issues as we go in throughout 2021. Uh, Project Democracy is continuing with an exploration of North Carolina democracy. So uh, we'll be continuing to dig deeper into these stories, connecting them to contemporary moments. So uh, alongside our colleagues like at Greensboro Public Library and uh, the great folks at National Military Parks. So I, again, I'm just thrilled to be part of this and thrilled to listen to Jason. So thank you again, Morgan. Thank you, Glenn. I feel like I just learned some stuff just listening to you talk. So that was great. All right, so now on with the show. So tonight's presenter is Guilford Courthouse National Military Park Interpretation Ranger Jason Baum. Jason has been a park ranger at Guilford Courthouse National Military Park since 2015. Originally from Zanesville, Ohio, he earned his bachelor's degree in history from Ohio University in 2009. After undergrad, he served over four years in the U.S. Army as an intelligence officer until 2014, when he moved to Greensboro to earn a master's in history with a focus in museum studies at UNC Greensboro. Go Spartans. All right, without further ado, I'm going to turn it on over to Ranger Jason. Thank you for those wonderful introductions and uh, good evening, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us for this program tonight. Let me share my screen with you because I've got some slides to go along with what I'm talking about. Let me make sure I get this set up correctly. All right, fantastic. So 10 things you might not know about the American Revolution or 10 common misunderstandings. Now, the way I picked these out is that these are 10 things that we routinely hear at the park and one thing I want you to think about when I talk about these that I don't want you if, if I mentioned something that you sincerely believed or you or you know you yourself have told other people don't feel like you got something wrong because one of the thing about all these subjects is that these are 10 nuggets of truth but they've had a lot of dirt and mud stuck to them over the years because what all these 10 things are trying to do is trying to answer some sort of question. But over the course of time, maybe people add some bad details, maybe some people forget some crucial details, but one way or another, a core detail, a core nugget of truth starts getting misshapen through retellings. So that's what we're kind of addressing here is 10 common misconceptions we hear all the time at the park. And really what hopefully as you, I go through this talk, what you'll hear is that the truth behind all these things is actually even more fascinating than what you remember. So the first one we're gonna deal with is Americans rebelled because crushing taxes were being put on them. And this largely stems from the common phrase everybody knows from school time is no taxation without representation. Even if somebody hasn't touched the revolution in years, they can generally recall that phrase very easily. And it's a good phrase because it's from the time period and it's a good summation. Now, where does it come from? What we think is that that phrase, no taxation without representation, originates in a London magazine in 1768. The London magazine was uh, essentially trying to explain to its readers, what are the Americans going on about? What is their problem? And as it's giving details of their complaints against things like the Stamp Act or the uh, Townsend Acts, it was at the top of each page, there's a uh, kind of a summary about what this article is about. And at the top of that page, it just said, no taxation without representation. Give you an idea what the broader article was about. By 1769, the following year, that phrase is appearing all the time in American pamphlets. And so that's how it, we may have entered the lexicon, although it does appear in a few pamphlets before then, back in 1765 with the Stamp Act. So that's where the phrase comes from, but then what's the problem with it? And the problem is that when people use this phrase, they lean too much on the first half of the statement, no taxation, and not the entirety of the statement. This, is a, this has a clause in the middle of it, no taxation without representation, but with representation, the taxation becomes okay. And so that's getting to the broader, deeper problem that they're actually dealing with. Now, where do these arguments come from and where do they evolve? Uh, to again, to start out in 1765 with no taxation without representation being used against the Stamp Act. And the reason it's being argued this way is that uh, the best way to explain it is that an 18th century lawyer and a lot of these uh, guys who are opposing the British um, 
actions have legal backgrounds is they're trying to argue the narrowest case possible. They don't want to get a big broad case where you can be attacked from all sides and you can have your logic undone. So you're doing as narrow as possible. Basically, it's no taxation without representation. The only problem is that the, the tax was for internal reasons in America, and that's not Parliament's job. Parliament should be only be taking care of trade, external taxation, the American assemblies, we deal with the internal taxation. The, where this finally gets to expand it and we get into that deeper problem that's actually being talked about here is in 1767 when the next series of acts comes out called the Townsend Acts. The Townsend Acts were more about external taxation, but also trying to rigorously enforce trade restrictions on Americans so that the revenue could be collected for the British government. It is when the Americans start opposing this again that voices in Britain kind of pipe up and say, well, wait a second. You guys said the problem was internal versus external. These are external measures. Now what's your gripe? And that's when we get to the, the real meat of the argument is about sovereignty. What we talk about when we talk about sovereignty is it's the issue of where power should ultimately reside and what its relationship to people is. And what we're, we have these two sides really talking about is not so much just taxation. No taxation without representation is getting to the issue of how is the empire supposed to function? According to Americans, they have a 17th century idea of it. And that idea is that America was an equal but separate piece of the British empire. And so what links them all together is the king. And so parliament shouldn't be interfering in their affairs, but at the same time, the colonies can't be interfering in England's affairs. Parliament views it completely differently. They are viewing this through an 18th century kind of frame. And that stems from what happened, what was called the Glorious Revolution in the 1680s. That's a time when the king is overthrown, uh, new monarchs are brought in, and when the new monarchs are brought in, they are forced to become what we today call constitutional monarchs. The idea was that they really don't have independent action anymore. They have to be consulted and consult with parliament to get anything done. It's the concept is sometimes called the king in parliament. It's not the king and parliament separately, the king has to act within the bounds that parliament puts on him. In doing that, that makes parliament supreme. That means they are supposed to be the supreme arbiters of how this empire functions, and they have the right to tell the colonies what they can and cannot do. So that's what we're really getting with when we say no taxation without representation. It wasn't a huge tax burden being put on the Americans. It is two sides with completely different viewpoints of how this empire is supposed to work and the problem that's really going to come up is the fact that both sides have fairly legitimate arguments about why they want to act that way, but they refuse to understand the other side. They're talking past each other for a full decade, and they're always assuming the worst of each other. The uh, British are always assuming that the Americans are naturally trying to rebel, and that it's just a small group of rebels up in New England who are leading everybody astray. The Americans assume at all times that the British Parliament and later the King have a devious plans to enslave them and undo all of their governments. And it's because of these mutual kind of suspicions of each other that things really start to deteriorate by the 1770s, eventually leading into what is the American War of Independence. And one last thing I want to say about this is that another reason that is not so much the taxation, it's the entire phrase is because when we look at taxation, uh, what was the actual taxation rate that people are experiencing? Uh, Britain saw its debt double after the French and Indian War, which had happened in the 1750s and 1760s. So they're trying to raise revenue to keep things going and get out of debt. And the reason they're trying to put more taxes and make taxes more fair with how the British and how the American colonies are working is that at this point, 2.5 million Americans are paying 1% of the taxes that 8.5 million Britons were expected to pay. On a per capita uh, basis, that means that Americans are paying 4% of the value that Britons were expected to pay. And that is in spite of the fact that when we look at economic data from back then, the average Joe American and average Joe Englishman had fairly similar standards of living. Some would even argue that the Americans had higher standards of living at that point. And yet they had also more purchasing power, but despite all this, despite this equal playing field economically, Englishmen and politicians in Britain are getting upset that they not only feel that they're not paying their way, not paying their fair share, but they're griping every time they're asked to pay their fair share. So it's a deeper, it's a much deeper kind of legalese argument that's 
kind of simmering beneath that phrase, no taxation without representation. It's about sovereignty. Where does the power of one government begin and the other government begin? That's what's kind of burbling up from beneath that. So as we move on to our second uh, kind of misunderstanding, Boston Massacre was the great uniting moment that led to the war for independence. I think this partially stems from the fact that the Boston Massacre is such an easy and it's such a dramatic event that it sometimes gets inserted in there as a crucial piece when I think the fascinating bit about it is that it's actually the turning point that wasn't. Well, so what happens for anybody who may not be uh, familiar with the events of the Boston Massacre is that troops had arrived in October of 1768 when there had already been some rebelling and some protests against the Townshend Acts. And during their time there, things start to calm down. And by 1770, when the Boston Massacre actually takes place, some troops had already been pulled out because things were starting to stabilize. And as they're stabilizing, it seems like tensions are easing. And But the problem is that the troops that are still there, there's still tension because there's infighting. There's frequent brawls that don't involve shooting, but fist fights and attacks, uh, sometimes British soldiers attacking uh, colonists, colonists attacking British soldiers, routinely antagonizing each other. And eventually that blows up in uh, 1770 when shooting starts. Essentially a mob kind of gathers around these uh, soldiers who are on guard post. They're harassing them. They're antagonizing them to shoot. One soldier gets knocked down. When he gets back up, he fires. And that leads to a horrible chain of events where several uh, Americans get killed. Now, why isn't this the turning point. Why is this the turning point that didn't happen? Uh, the, partly because both sides worked to ease tensions. Rather than ratchet up the rhetoric, one of the things that the British government does is they take those soldiers, they don't completely remove them from Boston, but they move them out of the city. They try and get them away from the people. Another thing they do is that, well, there were initial fears, those British soldiers who fired into the crowd wouldn't be, wouldn't either wouldn't be put on trial or they'd be put on trial back in England where a, the jury would be stacked in their favor, the British agreed to finally let them have the trial in Massachusetts. And when the trial finally happens later in 1770, all but two soldiers get acquitted. And that is partly because Captain Preston, the man who was in charge of the group, writes his own account that appears in newspapers. And he explains the complexity of the situation, that it was very confused, it was hectic, and basically lays out the argument that nobody was deliberately just trying to inflict violence on the Americans. And this kind of rubs against the grain of other reports that are appearing in the press at that time, where radicals like the uh, Sons of Liberty were claiming that it was just intentional bloody massacre meant to intimidate the Americans. And then there are more moderates that are trying to frame it in the press as an unfortunate series of events, and that really there's blame to go on both sides. So it's the fact that there's an actual trial of these soldiers. All these uh, facts are brought to light, are brought out in the open in that trial. And it's all these events that where both sides, you can see both sides trying to work to avoid conflict that really helps reduce the tension. And what we actually see is about a two year period after this uh, event where you really don't see major protests popping up in America. It's not gonna be until another event called the Gatsby Affair, which happens in New England, and then the tea tax when things get ratcheted back up again. And one last thing I do wanna mention about that is that it's also important to remember that when this happens, it's not just the press in Massachusetts and New England that you see different opinions in, it's the press throughout the colonies. And as a matter of fact, it's, there is a bit of a sense that in other colonies, they had no sympathy. They felt that it was those Sons of Liberty, those radicals up to it again, and they brought it upon themselves. So that's why there's also a willingness to wait for a trial because everybody wants to see what actually happened. And that's part of the reason why the Boston Massacre is a turning point that didn't happen because both sides actually took the time to try and see and get the facts out in the light of day so that everybody could understand what, what happened here. Third, independence was a goal since the Stamp Act of 1765. Sometimes there's an idea that pretty much from the time the French and Indian War ends in 1763, the Americans are just chomping at the bit to get independence. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the independence movement is a slow process. Hopefully you got from the first point, the idea that 
the arguments against the British Act slowly expand from just being a taxation matter to matters of sovereignty, you also see that in terms of who takes the blame when Americans want to protest and who they're griping against. And in one sense, at the very beginning in the early 1760s, the people who are often the target of these protests are not the king, not parliament, but crown officials, some uh, government official at the local level. And the protest kind of started as, hey, they're appealing to the governor, to parliament, to the king. These individuals are corrupt or they're inefficient or they're not doing their job correctly. Get them out of there and maybe that'll fix the problem. But then later protests expand to not wholesale blaming parliament yet, but saying, oh, the factional politics of parliament is what's causing this. Parliament keeps passing these ridiculous acts and it's not because they actually believe in it. It's because the partisan politics over in England is allowing these ridiculous acts to get through. When they still get no redress of their grievances, then the blame game gets a little bigger. Then it becomes parliament itself. Parliament is just off its hinges. Nobody's holding it back. It's running rampant over our liberty. And that's when you start seeing more and more uh, appeals to the king. And it goes back to that idea of a 17th century contract of how government should work. The idea that the king is the linchpin holding the empire together. They're appealing to the king. Hey, can you hold these guys back? You, you use what is called your royal prerogative or what we would consider a veto to stop some of these acts from getting through. And it's not until the king himself finally decides to declare the uh, colonies in open rebellion and start putting even more and more restrictive um, legislation against the colonies, eventually even closing down all trade with the colonies, that they start indicting the king himself. And that's why you see the king indicted in the Declaration of Independence. Part of the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances against the government and the king is the one being mentioned most often in that. And that's because at that point, to go with that idea of how the empire should work, it was now appearing that the king was the one who was causing all these problems because he wasn't doing his job and his role as holding the empire together. And so that's how you get this. Independence is a slow, steady, bit by bit growing over the 1760s and 1770s event. One, uh, one last thing I want to mention about that, too, uh, just to show how dedicated these people were to making amends and making peace before we get to 1776, is that after the Boston Tea Party happens in 1773, the British government passes what we call the Intolerable Acts, where they shut down the uh, port of Boston, they put a military governor in, they're sending more troops in, and to any American that seems like that is the warning bell that we've been talking about for decades. Look at the British, they're getting rid of the government. They're shutting down the port, troops flooding in. This is what we've been warning you about for decades. Even despite the fact that that is happening, when Boston appeals for help because its port has been shut down, the other colonies in the Continental Congress agree, but they require that Boston has to avoid further provocation. Because again, even in 1774 and 1775, the hope is that we're only a few months, maybe a year away, from making amends and everything going back to normal. So don't make things worse. 1775, American troops capture Fort Ticonderoga, a very important fort in the Hudson Valley. When it gets captured, even despite the fact that this happens after Lexington and Conqueror, so fighting's already started, Congress wants a full inventory of the stores of the fort. Because the idea, so being, we're only a few, way, few months maybe a year away from peace. And when the British army goes back into Ticonderoga, we want to have a list of stuff saying, hey, when we captured it, this was what was in here. It's still here. Good faith effort, trying to maintain peace. So it's really not until even beginning of 1776 that there is finally open debate at the state level first about independence. And it's the states who then start influencing their uh, members of the Continental Congress to discuss it at the congressional level. Again, it's a very slow, deliberate process. And the way to think about it is they're trying to go through every legal, peaceful uh, avenue that they can before they ever resort to war. They want to be a part of this empire. It is a giant, powerful trade empire. They want to profit from it. It is not until they feel they have no choice that they finally decide to start openly talking about independence. Moving on. Uh, so the next two are kind of linked, and sometimes we see them paired together. Sometimes they're paired separate. They appear separately. And it's ideas of how united were 
the two sides. How united were the Americans? And number five is going to be about how united were the British? Was it a monolithic war effort? As you can imagine, the reason I'm putting it on these slides is that it's a little more complex than that. To start off with the American side of things, it's a great John Adams quote that gets thrown around all the time, where John Adams says, a third of the Americans support the revolution, a third are against it, a third were neutral. Do not use that quote, because that is many years after the revolution, and John Adams, when he says that, is not speaking about the American Revolution, he's speaking about the French Revolution. He's saying the Americans were a third for the French Revolution, a third against the French Revolution, and a third didn't care. Getting to what we think the actual ratios are of who supported independence, who was in the middle, and who was a loyalist, my best guess and it's hard to do this because, as you can imagine, back then they didn't have Gallup polls. There was no, there were no newspaper men out in the corners asking people their opinions on all this stuff. So we kind of use rough math and rough ideas and statistics of who's joining what armies, who is selling goods to what armies to come up with these numbers. My best guess is that the majority, the, the largest group of Americans support independence. 40 to 45 percent of the population probably supports independence. 30 to 35% is probably in that neutral group, but remember, they're not fervently neutral. They're neutrals who can be influenced one way or the other. And then maybe 20 to 25% of Americans were still loyalists. And there's one historian, actually, John Shy, who he actually has an interesting prospect of suggesting that not only were neutrals the biggest group, he actually thinks neutral Americans were probably the majority, over 50%. And that he would suggest the way we understand how the Americans win the war is that they do, the uh, rebels who support independence were just better at convincing neutrals to support them than the British were at uh, convincing neutrals to remain loyalists. So to talk just a little bit about who these groups are then, what kind of makes them different. The uh, rebels who support independence are both fervent radicals, but also there's lukewarm people. Lukewarm rebels could be pre-war moderates who may have opposed British actions, but thought independence was too much. But when fighting happens, that's the convincing part that says, all right, the idea of independence is now acceptable to me. Now, what tends to unite these men is their fear that their economic or social status would be undermined by the continuing policies that were being passed by parliament. Now, as for those neutrals, there's two kind of facets to the neutrals. There's neutrals who really the way to think of them is that they just don't buy the rhetoric. Then I think of really people from around Greensboro, North Carolina, the back country of the Carolinas as being predominantly neutrals because from where they stood, I mean, I, I, I see your argument about what the British are doing, but it doesn't affect me. So uh, I'm gonna sit this one out. Now there's another aspect to neutrals, which is pacifists. And again, out here in uh, Western North Carolina, we have groups like the Quakers. Pacifists who uh, are, will not participate in violence. Violence is not how you solve your problems. And you have groups like them and you have uh, the Moravians as well. There's a large group of uh, uh, Quakers up in Pennsylvania as well. And so they're another faction of neutrals, but they would definitely represent those neutrals who there is, it's, re it's religion that dictates that position. So they're not gonna be swayed one way or the other to join independent or join the Tories in active campaigning. And then for the loyalist, one way we can describe these people is that similar to neutrals, they don't buy the rhetoric of the rebels, but the, and more important than that, many of these folks were enmeshed in the world of the trade and governance of the British empire. Maybe they were, they could be something as simple as a clerk who works in a British trade office. And so in that sense, they owe their uh, rise in society to participation in this empire. So of course they're not gonna bite the hand that feeds them. Another way to think about the uh, loyalist is, um, it's, it's, it's local. Sometimes local politics and local rivalries can cause people to take an, what would almost seem like an arbitrary decision. It could be something as simple as, let's say, uh, a theoretical person who lives here in the back country of North Carolina. I have a business dealing with John Doe over here and this is pre-war and it just went sour and I felt he gave me a bad deal. War comes, suddenly he's pro-independence. Well, I hate that guy. So you know what? I'm a loyalist now. I'm gonna get my revenge on him or vice versa. Suddenly he's a loyalist. Well, you know what? Now it's time to even scores. He's a loyalist. I guess that makes me 
a rebel. I'm going to go after him. And you see that kind of stuff in the backcountry, as well as what we would call the neutral ground around New York City. Uh, the large British uh, army spends most of its time in New York City for the course of the war. And so all kinds of parts of Western Connecticut, Southern New York, Eastern uh, Pennsylvania, Northern New Jersey become these fervent grounds for uh, kind of guerrilla warfare that we see here in the Carolina backcountry. And sometimes you see that. It isn't so much a political or ideological motivation to join one side or the other. It's a very local, very personal motivation that I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get my revenge on somebody. And like I said, the, if the Americans were not wholly unified in this effort, To briefly explain British politics at the time, and uh, I'll, off the cuff, I'll throw off a great, a great book suggestion would be a book by Justin Du Rivage. It's called Revolution Against Empire. And he does the greatest job of kind of categorizing uh, British politicians at this time. And he has to do that because parties have fallen apart. There used to be Tory and Whig. We get Tory from the British, and that's what we call loyalists. Tories were more very, they were very pro-monarchy. Whigs were for uh, kind of controlling and constricting the powers of the monarchy. They were used to be two very distinct that we get around to the American Revolution. The Tories have fallen apart and the Whigs have just had decades of almost unchallenged rule in Britain. And so what the way to think about parties then is that King George, the guy you see on your screen, he is a unique monarch who's gonna help restructure how politics work in this time period. He comes to the throne uh, after the French and Indian War in 1760s. And what he sees is he doesn't wanna work with the Whig government who is obviously constraining his power. He never goes outside of his bounds of what he's legally allowed to do. But during his tutelage as a young man, he learned how government worked. He learned how to play politics and he played the game better than anybody had before him. George I and George II come before him had pretty much kind of ignored domestic politics. They were more concerned about foreign policy. So that kind of makes George different. And when George comes to power, what he does is he starts pilfering politicians from the Whigs who he can tell are not for rapidly expanding the empire because they're afraid of debt. And all they care about is profits, profits for me, if, the empire, if I can do that with the empire big, good. If I can do it with the empire small, fine. He starts picking up those politicians, but also importantly, there are the remnants of the Tories. By this point, Tories made up maybe 20% of parliament, maybe less. He starts bringing them into the fold. And just like that, he starts building this amazing base to start pursuing policy. And the way this author I mentioned, Justin Du Rivage, mentions them, he calls this kind of coalition that's being built around the king as authoritarian reformers. They believe the colonies must be taxed to help fix the national debt. A strong government was crucial to protect the empire. Expansion must be controlled in incremental so you don't take on too much debt and things don't get out of hand. They wanted centralized power and they wanted the king actively involved. And they were mainly landowning elites who felt they knew what was best and should have the reins of power. Now, opposed to them are what we call the establishment Whigs. The establishment Whigs were probably the people who really were in control of politics for the decades leading up to this. Establishment Whigs, they're more in favor of supporting taxing the colonies, but only if it doesn't hurt trade. At the end of the day, trade needs the flow. That's how we all get rich together. And so we can tax, but if it hurts trade, stop it. The uh, credit and finance were perfectly acceptable to ways to finance the government. They don't care about debt. They care about managing the debt. But if the debt gets bigger, that's fine. So long as we have a way, we have a plan, we have a strategy how to deal with it. And this group tends to be a mixture of landed elites, but also some of the biggest merchants in Britain are all kind of a part of this establishment wig. And then there's a small, slowly growing group that is the only form of kind of political opposition you can find at the time. They would be called the radical wigs. Radical Whigs believe that government shouldn't just protect property. It needs to do more to protect the citizens and make their lives better. Taxing the colonies was clearly making things worse. Should not, should not be done. Tax the rich to rein in their power and check their corruption was a more favorable idea of how to run this empire. And they wanted to respect the colonies and partly because uh, kind of a slowly growing faction within the Radical Whigs were people who wanted more democracy in Britain at this time, because compared to the colonies, very few people had access to the vote 
in Britain. And there was another problem with how representation was proportioned. It was what we call, there's these things called rotten boroughs, where a town with maybe a few inhabitants would get two members to parliament, while a huge industrial city in the north with rapidly growing a population, it still only got two people to send to parliament. These are people who want government reforms at home, and that's why they feel some sense of comradeship with the Americans. So hopefully that gives you a summation of not only are the British not wholly unified in fighting this war, their internal politics are just as complex as the internal politics for the Americans. So uh, before I get into this one, uh, to kind of tell you where we're going with the next few questions, the first five were obviously very much uh, talking about the origins of the war and more politics. Now we're gonna get more into actual fighting. We're gonna be, these next five questions deal with the war of independence. And so with this one, this is fascinating because I've never actually heard that the idea that the British were wearing red coats to conceal blood. I'd never heard of that before I worked with the National Park Service. But in my years working with the National Park Service, I have heard this frequently. So I wanted to look into it, and I was actually disappointed as, as I was looking in, trying to find the origins of this, I have no idea. I have no idea where this originates from. I, my best guess would be that it's actually a joke that gets taken seriously and then gets taken as a true statement. It, there's jokes about why different armies wear different colors, and the punchline is always something about the real reason where they wear that color. But I have no idea what basis this was on. But to combat this, because it comes up so much, let's talk about the real reason why these guys are wearing red coats. So talk about one thing, the idea that we conceal blood. If you look at the pictures I put on here, you'll notice the bottom half of these gentlemen are a lot of white cloth. If they are gonna get injured, there's a lot of white that's gonna make that blood stand out real big. The other problem is that in those clothes, uh, when somebody gets wounded and bleeds, there's tons of descriptions that describe it as being a dark black stain, very obvious. And so the visual aspect of it doesn't hold up. And then there's the other fact that if you're a British soldier in line, chances are if somebody next to you gets wounded, you're gonna hear the bullet thud and hit them. You might hear them make a noise. You might see them on the ground in agony. It's gonna be very hard to conceal that bit. The other thing for the other side of the battlefield, if you're one of the Americans and maybe the British are trying to conceal blood because they don't want you to see that you're hurting them. Again, you'll see somebody dropping down, but more than likely you won't see anything. Because as you can see in that bottom picture, these battlefields were absolutely choked with smoke. When a unit of 300 guys let off a volley where they fire all their weapons at once, you could have a cloud of smoke completely obscure that giant line of infantry that was standing ahead of you just a second ago. So the idea that you would be able to see the detail where you could tell that someone was bleeding is highly unlikely. So why do they wear these uniforms this way? Well, one thing is that you don't need to worry about um, camouflage so much. Like I said, the way they fight is they're in giant lines, best illustrated by the top uh, picture, giant lines marching around out in the open, firing all at once. Even if you gave them modern camouflage, it's not gonna really conceal them because they have to get within 100 yards of you before they start firing anyway. Giant lines of guys out in the open, can't really cover that up. So there's really no reason to try and camouflage them anyway. And the other reason is that bright colors can actually be helpful. Because again, with that thick smoke, being able to see bright colors, distinct colors, as well as their giant bright flags that they'd be carrying in the middle of their line are important to see who, what units are where, what are they doing, what kind of state they're in. So if anything, the red is more about signaling to everybody else in your army where you're at, what unit you are, as well as being able to easily identify who on the battlefield is an enemy, who is friendly. Now, why red? Uh, as far as I can tell, from what I looked at, red is being used as early as the 1500s. So this is many hundred years before, and uh, to kind of focus on the English Civil War, which happens in the 1640s, we have descriptions of uh, armies wearing red coats, wearing blue coats, wearing white coats. Part of the standardization of the red coat for the British Army is partially tied to what is called the new model army. So the English Civil War was the King versus Parliament. And if you've ever heard of Oliver Cromwell, he's one of the important leaders for the Parliamentarian Army. And when they're about midway through the war, there's an attempt to standardize their army. 
And one of the ways they're trying to standardize them is they want professional soldiers because most soldiers were kind of temporary, more like what you would think of with militia. They want professional soldiers who have experience and have standardized training. So that's one way they're standardizing. Another the way they're standardizing is with the weapons and the drill that they're using. And another way they're standardizing is they want everybody dressed the same. Part of the reason that it ends up being red of all colors was actually economics. At that time, Venetian red was the cheapest dye. So if you're gonna try and mass produce uniforms for all these huge units all at once, it's believed that it was partially economical why uh, a color they were already using red kept being used because that was the cheapest one for an army that was struggling to pay for the war effort. So that's kind of, uh, again, that's just a fascinating one that I'd never heard of before. And even still, I don't want you to think that everybody absolutely is standardized in red because even by the time of the American Revolution, you still have, for example, the British artillery wear blue coats. You have dragoon units, which are cavalry units wearing green coats. So you still have some variation of color, but the idea of a standardized kind of red being used during the American Revolution is kind of boils down to tradition. It was a color that was used before, it gets standardized and it just keeps carrying on through the years. Number seven, the British didn't know how to fight the Americans. The British didn't understand partisan warfare. The British didn't know how to fight in the woods. And part of this is trying to understand why a big powerful empire and why their army and navy would fail to be a bunch of rebels bunch of Americans, bunch of backwoodsmen. And sometimes it's associated with, they just didn't get it. They were used to fighting in those nice orderly lines and clear open fields in Europe. And when the British, excuse me, when the Americans start using what we've considered more American Indian tactics, uh, more what we today call guerrilla tactics, it was just blew their mind. But the thing is, you gotta remember the French and Indian war happened just before this. The French and Indian war is a great learning experience for the British. In that war, it was the British versus the French and both sides were actively courting the support of American Indian tribes. So in that sense, you have a very real learning experience of the French and Indian war right before this. And also you have both, not only amongst the French and British, in Europe itself, you have all kinds of uh, military writers trying to develop doctrine. They have all kinds of names at this point for this. Sometimes it's called petite guerre. Uh, that's the French name. Irregular warfare was a uh, phrase that was used more in English. And a uh, phrase that's used to associate with fighting in North America specifically is called skulking sometimes. More, it's, it's usually applied to the way American Indians fight. But all of these phrases are being used to reference soldiers who don't stand up in giant open lines. They use cover. They don't maybe wear a uniform. And sometimes they don't even attack your infantry. They'll attack your supply bases or they'll do hit and run raids and instead of trying to create a stand up pitched battle. The British understood this. There was military doctrine already in place by the time the American Revolution happens. So much so that the first commander in chief for the British Army, his name was William Howe, he literally wrote a manual on irregular warfare. Uh, the man who follows him, Sir Henry Clinton, who is in command by the time the Battle of Guilford Courthouse happens, has a vast library that includes military manuals that talk about this kind of warfare. So it wasn't a foreign idea to them. They knew, and they also had the units to fight it with. There are specialized units at this time. There's light infantry, generally guys who might be a part of a regular unit. Sometimes they're consolidated into their own unit, but they do that. They, instead of being in a, uh, a solid line, they spread out into the woods, they hide, they fight, they kind of move around on their own. You have rifle units, both the British and uh, their ally, Germanic allies, the Hessians have rifle units. So guys who are, instead of using those smooth bore muskets are using the rifles where you can hide behind a tree at 200 yards and pick somebody a uh, single target off. So they have that as well. They also have what are called ranger units. Ranger units, really you can consider that the 18th century equivalent of special forces. Guys who are doing long distance raids, hit and run away from the main army where you're trying to just harass the enemy army without trying to bring them to general battle. So the British know exactly how these tactics work. They've experienced what they have experienced with them. What is the nugget of truth behind this? Why? Do they fail is not because they don't understand it. It is because they don't have the means to counteract it. They have a hard time recruiting loyalists. Recruiting loyalists would be important to understanding the lay of the land. 
they have a hard time keeping cavalry healthy. A routine thing that happens throughout this war is that when they try and ship horses across the Atlantic or from one end of the colonies to the other, most of the horses die off. And the reason that's important is you need cavalry, you need mobility specifically, so that when American rebels are popping up here, there, and everywhere, you have the mobility and the force that can go and continue playing that game of whack-a-mole with the uh, guerrilla fighters. Being unable to maintain large units of cavalry removes that mobility that you need to be able to effectively counteract the American guerrillas. And when you can't do that, you can't protect the loyalists. That helps make the recruiting loyalist problem worse. And so essentially it boils down to, again, the British failing to gather the necessary means as well as stick to the plan of how to fight the guerrillas, that, that's ultimately what undo, un, undoes their war effort. Number eight. So next two are about more important personalities related to this. And I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. I see I'm going quite a long time. And I want to leave time for you guys to be able to ask questions and for us to answer some questions. Bannister Tarleton. He's a war criminal. He's a sociopath. He is uniquely violent maniac. And sometimes this was kind of made worse by the portrayal by uh, the British actor Jason Isaac in the movie The Patriot. Colonel Tavington shoves a bunch of colonists into a church and burns it down with them all trapped inside. That kind of builds on stuff that comes from the revolution itself. And really the major sticking point for Tarleton is the Battle of the Waxhaws. Waxhaws is May 29, 1780. This happens just after the British have captured Charleston. And what we essentially have is Charleston's cavalry, his dragoons and light infantry, are pursuing a unit of Virginia Continentals. They were on their way to Charleston to help out. When they get word that Charleston has surrendered and the American army has surrendered there, they start heading back north. So Charleston's trying to catch them before they can get away and unite with another American force. He finally tracks them down. He demands they surrender in a kind of a bluff hoping that maybe they'll just give up so he doesn't have to come into a fight. When they refuse, his men ride up and aggressively ride right into them. Now the myth is that this was some so, there was some sort of manufactured massacre, that as the Americans tried to surrender, they just willingly destroyed them. It was intentional. They all knew from the very beginning they were gonna slaughter every American they could come across. The reality of the situation is a lot more complex. It is probably, any soldier's nightmare to ever be in the position that these two forces were in. As the British are appro approaching, Abraham Buford, the commander of the American side, sends a flag of truce over to Tarleton because the fighting is going on now. He sees he is overmatched. And so he's trying to end the bloodshed. As the rider is going to Tarleton, Tarleton's horse gets shot out from under him and pins him to the ground. This affects both sides in two ways. For the Dragoons, who've just seen their commander potentially killed, all while a flag of truce was on the way, this feels like the ultimate betrayal. These, these Americans are double-crossing us. So they start attacking the Americans again. For the American side, who felt that there were, someone was trying to end the battle, and now they're randomly attacking us again, well, we got to fight on. And that leads to continued fighting. And while there are a lot of dead and wounded from this battle, the important thing to remember is that it wasn't deliberate. There wasn't an idea that even as they surrender, we're going to deliberately kill these, we're going to kill any American we're going to come across. It was essentially a moment of pure chaos that is not unusual in a battle. That being said, it's still very important to know that this is how it's portrayed because it gets used as effective propaganda during the war in the South. It is referred to as the Waxhaws Massacre. Tarleton's play is sometimes used as a phrase to refer to Tarleton and the British refusing to take prisoners. Again, it wasn't a refusal to take prisoners. It was chaos. It was things getting out of hand. And so that's one way that this myth of Tarleton gets spun out. And the nugget of truth I want you to take away from this one is that Tarleton's a very aggressive combat commander. There are times when, like Waxhaws, where men who are trying to surrender get cut down because of the sheer confusion. But he's not a sociopath. After this battle happens, he sends for doctors from Charleston to try and help care for the wounded who have been taken in this battle. And he's also not a, this kind of cruel, cold martinet of a man who nobody liked on either side. Because one thing that we know from him is that people who generally met him found him very polite, very uh, affable. And sometimes in his political reel, they thought he was a little too uh, plain speaking, but that actually played very well to his, his political constituents. 
And also his men had a deep loyalty to him. He trained them hard, he drove them hard, but they felt he had their best interests in mind. He felt that he knew what he was doing. And so that's why they have this devoted loyalty to him. So it's one, it's, it's again, if we had more time, I'd go deeper into this, but it's, Tarleton is a much more complex figure than what you would get, what you would pull away from that movie. He's an interesting man who is a product of his time in some ways, but in the case of the Wax Hawks, I guess what I would leave you with is that he experienced a commander's nightmare that nobody would ever want to experience in battle. Moving on, the next uh, interesting personality is Peter Francisco. There's a lot of myth attached to this guy as well, but he's fascinating. I encourage you to look him up because he's very cool. He's at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. But unfortunately, one thing we have to admit is that part of a myth, a myth that's about him is perpetuated at the park. If you look at the bottom picture, that is a plaque from the Cavalry Monument at Guilford Courthouse, and it states that Peter killed 11 men at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. He did not kill 11 men at Guilford Courthouse. How do we know this? He says so. In his own pensions, uh, his one pension account says he kills two men at Guilford Courthouse, and later pension account, he ups the number to four. And that's understandable, because pensions were done 30 years after the war, so it's very understandable that somebody might not be able to recall events perfectly years and years after. But it's through Peter Francisco's own words that we know it's the numbers two to four. It's not 11. He didn't, he wasn't a one man wrecking crew. Now, another important myth is the stamp you see above that's a commemorative stamp that was issued. He's carrying a cannon off the battlefield. That is, and he, he actually uh, in several occasions perpetuates this myth saying that he carried an 1100 pound cannon off the battlefield of Camden. The problem with that is that, to give you reference, the current world record for a squat without using knee wraps or special equipment. So we're talking about Olympic lifting, weight on your shoulders. The current world record is 1,080 pounds. So what we are trying to say here is that this guy did a world record squat in an era where he's a soldier. So he doesn't have ideal conditions. He's not training for this every single day. And he also has a bad diet. So he's not getting the calories and the protein he probably needs to be able to lift that much weight. Also very important, he's been in battle. He's been serving since 1776. In one battle, he gets shot in the leg and he himself says it was a wound that troubles him for the rest of his life. So he's been shot in the leg once and he's been stabbed in the abdomen with a bayonet once. He's, he's not the ideal candidate to be doing some sort of world record uh, Olympic lift. So what's the plausible reality of this. One suggestion is that instead of carrying it on his shoulder, Peter might have picked the trail of the gun, so the entire carriage, and dragged it off that way. And another plausible idea is that the American army doesn't just have six pounders, which is what he is portrayed as carrying right there. They had three pounders, a smaller cannon that only weighed about 212 pounds. Now that is a much more realistic weight that he could potentially be carrying off the battlefield. But despite these plausibilities, the one thing we also have to recognize is that at the Battle of Camden, the American army lost all of its artillery. The British captured all the guns, so even if he is dragging it off, he must have had to abandon it at some point during the route. And one thing, uh, one last thing I do want to get in about him, though, is that when you look past some of these myths, because there's also myths about how tall he was, there's references to him being six foot six, six foot eight. Uh, more reliable references say he's over six feet, being a general reference. His own son writes a book uh, after his death saying that he was six foot one. All these myths obscure probably the actual cool story from Camden, which is that Peter, as the American army is falling, about, falling apart at the Battle of Camden, there's a British dragoon riding and is about to ride down his uh, commander of his unit. And Peter kills the guy and saves Colonel, the guy's the, Colonel Mayo, saves his life. He then gets on the dragoon's horse, starts riding around, yelling to the other dragoons, trying to confuse them and lead them away to buy time for his fellow comrades. That happens at Camden. That is way more endearing and more fascinating to learn about than the potential idea that he might be carrying this cannon off of its case off the battlefield. And what that also links to is another myth. There's this myth that there was a five foot sword made for Peter Francisco. The sword that we know that he gets before the Battle of Guilford Court Courthouse that he uses at Guilford Courthouse was made by Colonel Mayo. Colonel Mayo sent him that sword as a way of saying, thanks for saving my life. And so that's another way in which some of these myths that are attached to him kind of obscure these genuinely fascinating stories that he went through. And I, like I said, I encourage you to look him up. He serves the entire war. He's in numerous battles. He gets wounded 
time and time again. Guilford Courthouse, he takes a bayonet wound from his knee to his hip, and yet he lives and keeps on going. So Peter Francisco is a fascinating guy, but you got to be careful about what's plausible and what's not. Final one, final one. All right. Hopefully we can get to some of these questions, and I, I'll try and make this as short as possible. This relates directly to the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, is the idea that at the end of the battle, the great culmination of the battle around the courthouse complex, a British unit, uh, what you see in the painting, British unit is coming to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with an American unit. And the idea is that Cornwallis sees what's happening, and he has his artillery fire great shot, great, excuse me, grape shot deliberately into the melee, regardless of whether it's going to kill his own men. He just wants to knock them all down. And the quote that establishes this says, as one uh, general is protesting uh, using such a tactic, uh, Cornwallis is alleged to have said, true, but this is a necessary evil which we must endure to arrest impending destruction. Now, the problem with that is where that comes from. The guy in the center, you'll see, that is Light Horse Harry Lee, an accomplished cavalry commander. He is at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, another fascinating person I encourage you to look up. So he's at the battle, and he's, it's in his memoirs that this is coming from, but there's a problem. Lee and his unit are not there. They're not at the fighting that is going on around the courthouse complex. They're a half mile south at a separate fight that had broken out in the woods. So not only is he not in the area, but even if he was in the area, there's no way he could have heard this kind of conversation going on over the din of battle. What we think actually happened, because again, there's a nugget of truth in here, is that as this melee is going on, what had happened was that there was also Continental Cavalry in the area. They had charged into those British troops and stopped them and made it possible for those blue-coated men from Maryland to also launch a bayonet attack. What Cornwallis is doing is that he sees the Continental Cavalry regrouping to attack his soldiers again. So he fires grape shot into them. And that picture on the far right, that is grape shot. Essentially what you're doing is you're taking a cannon, instead of firing one solid ball out, you're firing a bunch of uh, iron balls the size of golf balls out. They spread out everywhere. They turn your cannon into a giant shotgun. In an effort to help his infantry escape and drive this cavalry away, he's using a giant shotgun. A lot of the stuff hits the cavalry, it drives them away, but a lot of stuff hits where he doesn't want it to. It hits men from Maryland, it hits some of the British troops as well. So there are friendly fire casualties. But the idea that it was an intentional, ruthless, I don't care what happens to my men prospect is highly unlikely because he is so far out in the back country, he can't easily replace his losses. The idea that he would willingly kill off more of his men is it's borders on being absurd. And with that, that is 10 common misunderstandings I encounter all the time at the park. And like I said, hopefully, if you heard these as well, don't take it as I'm trying to be like, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about. No, there's genuine facts behind these things, but we gotta always remember to sift out, investigate, and that's what you are. When you are being a historian, you're being an investigator. You have to learn where these uh, phrases are coming from, is this person reliable, and then slowly dig your way down into the truth. Awesome. Jason, thank you so much. My brain feels like 10 pounds heavier right now. <laughs> so I know we are at time, but I do want to get to some questions. So for anyone that does have to leave, um, we are still recording this. I'm going to go ahead and record the Q&A. Um, and we will probably be putting this up on the library's Facebook. Um, so if you have to run, um, but want to hear the answer to maybe a burning question you have, uh, don't worry, you can, you can still catch it. So um, the first question we have for you um, comes from Lou. Please explain the role and impact of the Trans-Appalachian settlements in armed conflict with the British allies, British or the allies in the Revolutionary War. So the, the immediate people who come to mind when I think of the Trans-Appalachian Americans is the a group called the Overmountain Men. Overmountain men were settled in what is today Eastern Tennessee. They are very important to several battles of the back country, but the most notable is the Battle of Kings Mountain. Kings Mountain is essentially where a lot of these Overmountain men and some militia from North and South Carolina catch and ambush a British force and annihilate it. And so that's one important, it, it's literally considered, um, we have sources from the era of British generals, British troops saying Kings Mountain was a turning point of the war. So that they, they're directly involved in that. Another 
way they're involved is in causing the revolution to some extent. Part of the conflict that's going on in 1760s, the, that's causing friction between the British government and the Americans is the fact that there are people settling west of the Appalachians and they weren't supposed to. The British government wants to control the spread of its empire because it doesn't want to get committed. It doesn't want frequent wars with the American Indians that cost a ton of money. And so they're trying to restrict who is going over there, but they're also trying to restrict who is trading with the American Indians. Because another source of conflict was the fact that there were a lot of traders going out west in either price gouging American Indians or selling them goods for a reasonable price. But then when the goods arrive, there's not as much as they paid for or there's substandard, giving them garbage for the money they just spent. So that's another way in which settlements west of the Appalachians helped kind of cause the American Revolution. It was, there was a big conflict over how this empire was going to expand. And one other thing I'll, that also always fascinates me is not just the over mountain men and their settlements in Eastern Tennessee. By this point, there are thousands of Americans settled in central Kentucky at this point. I mean, it could almost have been its own colony already by the time the American Revolution starts. So that's, that's two different ways that they really influenced the war. Awesome, thank you. So um, from T. Brooks Lyles, uh, they ask any new archeological digs planned and is there any new signage in the works, particularly in the area of the third line? At this time, we don't have anything planned. Um, it generally, uh, we have to we have to partner with a group. To, we tend to partner with universities to do digs. Uh, we've done digs looking for where the courthouse pre was previously. There were other projects where ground penetrating radar was trying to use, trying to find what is called the Reedy Fork Road. Uh, I'm glad I saw this picture up. The Reedy Fork Road would have been just behind where you see the horizon in this picture. That's the retreat route that the Americans used to get off the battlefield. We don't know exactly where it is yet. Um, exciting things are that the park has actually expanded a little bit over the last few years. And so we need to do archaeological digs of the new grounds we've uh, picked up. And there will definitely be, in the few, far future, new signage there. But um, in terms of new signage for the third line, um, nothing I can report on at this time. Great. Thank you. Um... Did also have um, some comments um, and then I'll get to our last question. And again, if you have any questions, uh, anybody left um, that you would like to ask, please go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, Jim commented that uh, when you were talking about uh, the British red coats, um, that the gun decks on British frigates were painted red so that they did not show blood. I think that's interesting. And also, T. Brooks um, also commented that English artillerymen wore blue coats, um, but so did English naval officer and U.S. musicians red, uh, wore red coats too. So there you go, lots of coat colors. And uh, even uh, British engineers, uh, sometimes there are depictions of them in that area, either wearing a red coat, but with different colored facings. But there's also, I've also seen pictures of engineers wearing blue coats as well. Very cool. All right. So um, for our last question, it comes from Lisa. Lisa wants to know more about loyalists. Um, so you talked a little bit about loyalists, but um, especially in North Carolina, what was some of the geographical or ethnic commonalities to those who supported the crown in North Carolina? Well, the biggest or I would say most famous would probably be the Highlanders, Scot Scottish immigrants uh, down in what is today the Fort Bragg Fayetteville area. They were very important. And there's a big battle that happens early in the war called the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge, also a national park, by the way. Uh, visit it if you have the opportunities down by Wilmington. So they're very important to playing a uh, part as loyalists. And it had to do with how they got their land and what kind of what levels of loyalty they feel they owe to the British government for that position. Um, Aside from that, another way that loyalists are kind of speaking specifically to North Carolina loyalists is that before the revolution happened, there was what is called the Regulator Rebellion. And that was more of an East-West conflict. Backcountry uh, North Carolinians felt they were underrepresented. There's unfair taxation. There's unfair ways that debts were being uh, paid off, the, the way the courts were being used. And so some of those folks who were pre-war would seem like rebels because they were rebelling against the royal governor and the Eastern elites, they, they, who we today call regulators, some of them 
end up becoming uh, pro-independence rebels, but a lot of them are neutral and loyalist. And again, that I think that kind of helps bring up that point I made earlier of local politics could sometimes influence how you felt. So suddenly you see all these coastal elites becoming rebels overnight, and they just put down your movement to get fair representation in government. Why would I want to ally with them? So that's another way that the unique human human terrain is what I'll call it. The human terrain of North Carolina influences who loyalists are in this colony. Fabulous. Well, I don't see any more questions. Um, so I just want to say one more time, thank you so much, Jason. I've learned so much. Um, you're getting lots of accolades in the comments. Um, this was a great way to start the new year, learning something new, some encouragement to, you know, one thing we can all still do during this time of COVID is safely get out uh, to your national park. So if you're from Greensboro, North Carolina, we are very fortunate to have um, a fabulous national park in our own backyard. So put on that mask socially distance and come visit it. Um, same goes for the library. The library does continue to be open. So Jason and I've, I've put it in the comments. Um, Jason did a great promotional video for this program where he talks about his uh, four favorite books about the revolution. You can check those all out from the library. Our doors are open to you. So also grab your mask, come on down to the library, get those books checked out. Um, also want to mention Jason has done, so if you can't make it out right now, Jason has done some really great videos that take you on a virtual tour of Guilford Courthouse National Military Park. And you can actually find those um, through uh, Google's Guilford Courthouse's uh, website. Uh, Jason um, is the, the main interpreter in the video, so you'll get to see Jason again. Uh, Jason, anything else you'd like to share with us before uh, the ending of today's program? Um, no, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for everybody who showed up tonight. Um, you are why I love my job. It's, I, get, I, I literally get paid to talk about the stuff that interests me most, and it's you make that possible. Thank you for uh, coming out. And I would encourage you all to keep reading and keep challenging what we know and what we think we know about the American Revolution. As we approach the 250th anniversary of the revolution, uh, the big events will be in 2026, around the time of the uh, celebrating Declaration of Independence. You know, there's tons of great scholarship coming out every day, brand new books about the revolution, brand new books about these individuals. I encourage you to keep digging because there's tons of wacky stuff still out there to be discovered. Amen. All right, everyone. Have a fabulous evening. Uh, be well, be safe. And we hope to see you at Guilford Courthouse National Military Park, the Greensboro History Museum, and of course, the Greensboro Public Library. Bye-bye.